contributions to the electrochemical performance of urban infrastructure. Uh, first introduction. Uh, modern technology and modern systems have created a need for small wireless sensors that can be placed around uh, a factory or a vehicle uh, in order to monitor the health of said factory or vehicle. Um, these wireless sensors need to be unobtrusive, self-powered, and have a long cycle life. Uh, simply because uh, the application for these sensors requires that uh, the user maintain constant, real-time uh, updates about the health of the system. Uh, for example, in an army vehicle uh, that's out in the field, uh, you'd want to know if the engine's about to die on you when you're out on a campaign. You don't want to be stuck in the middle of nowhere, so you want to have some sort of feedback uh, to know when parts need to be replaced, when things need to go out of commission. Um, and because of the nature of where these sensors may be placed, it may be impossible or it could be difficult, uh, or simply cumbersome to change sensors. Um, so these would be designed to have a life of 10 to 15 years. Uh, why capacitors? Uh, because the sensors must be unobtrusive, they must be small. And if the sensors are small, they must have small onboard batteries. And if the batteries on board are also small, then they must inherently have a low power density. Uh, power density refers to the rate of energy transfer possible per unit volume. Uh, in simpler terms, it means how much energy can you pull out of one unit uh, volume of a certain thing at a time. Um, as you might imagine, if you try and pull too much power out of the battery too fast, you'll, even if the battery is rechargeable, you'll degrade the battery very quickly. Uh, and if the device is meant to last 15 years, it's not going to make it past maybe six months. So, on this graph of power density versus energy density, you can see batteries in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, they have a very high energy density but low power density, uh, which is typical of batteries. Uh, for example, think of a small coin cell in your watch. Uh, power draw on that battery is pretty low because it's just powering your, your mechanism. Uh, but that battery can power your watch for three, four, five years. Uh, but on the other hand, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see capacitors, which might have a very low energy density, but uh, instead have a very high power density. Uh, when used in tandem, uh, the, printed super, the capacitor can be used as a supplement to augment the battery system, where uh, the battery can provide uh, a low power drop over a long period of time while the capacitor steps in whenever a large current is drawn. Um, I'd like to point you to the schematic in the upper right. Um, this device is a device that my lab is currently developing. Um, the goal is to have an entirely printed sensor uh, that can be flexible and attached to any surface. Um, and on the bottom right hand corner, uh, the graph there uh, shows a typical cycle of the radio that this device will be powering. Uh, the red curve that you can see ranging from negative 1.5 to about 0.7 milliseconds represents 1% of a typical duty cycle, the other 99% the device being at idle. When the device is at idle, the sleep mode draw is so low that it's not even on the graph. Um, the sleep mode power draw is low enough that the battery can power it uh, without any problem. But whenever a pulse of information needs to be sent or received, um, this places a huge power draw on the battery, which would otherwise degrade the battery's health. And that's where the capacitor steps in, because the capacitor has high power density, um, and in this case, uh, uh, irrelevant low energy density, is able to sustain that brief momentary load. And lastly, why printing? Uh, printing is a cost-effective cost method with potential for high throughput and uh, a lot of flexibility in design. Um, these three methods here show three possible uh, printing methods. Uh, dispenser printing, in which uh, a design is printed out drop by drop. Uh, screen printing, uh, where a stencil is laid down and ink is smeared through the stencil. Um, that's commonly used for t-shirts and other fabrics. And flexographic printing, uh, which is a roll-to-roll -roll ink printing process commonly used in newspaper printing. Uh, my Research this summer focused mainly on dispenser printing and uh, pseudo screen printing, uh, mainly because flex graphic was too costly and not possible to obtain. Now, some background. Uh, first off, what is a capacitor? Um, as mentioned previously, a capacitor is an energy storage device usually used for high power, low energy applications. Um, in a traditional capacitor, uh, a parallel plate capacitor, you have two parallel plates. Uh, which encompass a dielectric material in between. And when an electric field is charged across the parallel plates, 
the molecules inside the dielectric actually shift in their places to resist that charge. Um, and when the field is released, the mole when the molecules reshift back to their equilibrium positions, that's what generates the electricity, or the energy. Um, this is analogous to stretching a rubber band and then releasing a rubber band and having energy come out of that way. On the other hand, an electrochemical, ca or an electrochemical capacitor or an electric double layer capacitor, also known as a supercapacitor, uh, works a little bit differently. Um, this is more similar to a battery in that you have two electrodes uh, and an electrolyte in between them with some sort of ionic solution uh, in the electrolyte. Um, the charge separation in the electric double layer capacitor comes from the separation of ionic charge, uh, specifically the separation of the positive and negative ions adsorbing onto the surfaces of the two different electrodes. Um, and consequently, when the potential difference is released, the ions shift back to their equilibrium positions. Um, now, because uh, EDLCs uh, store charge through adsorption of ions onto electrode surfaces, the electrode surfaces themselves must necessarily have a high surface area. Um, if the pore size, say, is too large, um, and the ions are too small, then essentially you're wasting space as the relatively spherical ions uh, have wasted space in between them. And if the pores are too small and the ions can't fit in there, then you're wasting space entirely. Um, so for the best performance, pore and ion size must match. Um, a previous grad student in my lab who graduated uh, several years ago uh, successfully printed a supercapacitor using mesocarbon microbeads, uh, which have 6 to 28 micron uh, diameter particle size. Uh, in comparison, though, the ions, which are relatively small and have a diameter of a few nanometers, are uh, much smaller than that. Um, so I opted to go with activated carbon, which has a 1 to 10 nanometer particle size. Uh, going back to this graph briefly, you can see that supercapacitors span the range between capacitors and batteries, uh, making them very versatile and uh, uh, modifiable for whatever need you might have. Uh, now for my research methodology, my approach was to fully print a self-supporting sandwich structure um, with the electrode sandwiching gel electrolyte, then sandwiched by a current collector. Self-supporting in this instance means that there are no casings or shells required to keep the device together. Uh, in order to actually print these devices, uh, it requires making some sort of ink. Um, the ink making process is relatively similar. Uh, dissolve a polymer binder into a solvent, add the particles, mix, and then print. Um, the left, uh, bottom left diagram shows uh, the dispenser printing mechanism, while the bottom right shows my pseudo screen printing uh, method, uh, in which I basically just cast uh, and smeared the ink onto a substrate. Uh, the component inks when dry uh, look something like this. Uh, the thicknesses of these are all about 50 microns, which is less than the diameter of human hair. And now my results. Um, the first thing I tried was the dispenser printing, simply because it was very easy to control uh, and control the shape. Um, underneath the, the top layer of electrode is another electrode, uh, which was printed to perfectly cover the bottom one. Um, and you can see the size is pretty small, a penny for reference. Uh, the active area, which is the area surface area of the carbon electrodes, is about 0.25 square centimeters. On the other hand, the cast films uh, have a much messier design. Um, the top picture shows the top view, the bottom picture shows the underside. Um, you can see the current collector is sticking out uh, from the top, uh, gets shown again on the bottom, and the electrodes printed in two different sizes with the electrolyte completely covering them. This is to ensure that I didn't have any shorts anywhere. Uh, and to make sure that it had at least some uh, working area. The active area is shown in the electric visible on the top picture, and that area is about two square centimeters. Um, one very significant issue I had while trying to cast these and print these was uh, processing parameters. Uh, the seven shown there are drawing time, sweep, temperature, humidity, ink, quantum uh, homogeneity, viscosity, composition, uh, the cast layer thickness, these all played a part in how well the films dry. Uh, you can see some failed results here. Um, if the humidity was too high or if it dried too long, they twisted and warped like a Pringle. Um, if the uh, ink was too dry when it cast a second layer on, the top layer ended up cracking. Um, so there are a lot of difficulties with this. 
Uh, but eventually, I did get some devices uh, successfully printed. Uh, this is a cross section of the assembled layers. Um, you can see that the interfacial uh, unions between the three layers is relatively smooth. Um, it's because the same binder and same polymer are used. So when the when a new ink was passed on top of the dried electrode, the top layer of the dried layer uh, was actually dissolved by the new solvent that was being added on top. Um, however, because the processing parameters mentioned earlier, it wasn't always perfect. You can see where the arrow is pointing uh, that there is some delamination occurring, which I'll expand on later. Um, this is a cross section of the cast electrodes, or cast devices. Um, again, these are also very homogenous at the interfaces. Um, and again, the interface homogeneity is crucial here because the electrolyte ions need to absorb onto the electrode surfaces. Um, and again, because of the processing parameters, you can see some instances where the electrode and electrolyte layer is delaminated. Um, this would later prove to have uh, poor consequences on the electrical performance. Um, finally, I managed to print out successfully working devices and cycle them for a different amounts of time. Uh, the left column shows the Mesa carbon microbeads that I used as a standard, and the right side shows an activated carbon electrode or capacitor that I made to. Uh, seen improvements. Both are dispenser printed, and the charging efficiencies are roughly the same, about 0.37, but the uh, energy and discharge capacity of the activated carbon electrodes is uh, much higher by two orders of magnitude than the uh, base carbon microbeads, um, proving that the smaller particle size does help. Um, next, I compare uh, a dispenser printed and a cast activated carbon capacitor. Um, the charging efficiency uh, and discharge capacity of, or sorry, the energy of the cast capacitor are also uh, are slightly lower. Uh, my guess is mostly due to the interfacial core interfaces between them, caused by crossing parameters. Uh, but discharge capacity is higher by another order of magnitude, um, proving that this method may indeed uh, create better devices with higher throughput. Finally, conclusions. As I said earlier, Smaller particle sizes significantly increase performance. Casting may allow better adhesion at the expense of less controlled shape. And processing parameters are hugely important in how the final device works. Future work, uh, will uh, I will investigate further cycling of the dispenser printed capacitors. Um, try adding ionic liquid to the electrodes to better facilitate ionic charge separation. Uh, print on different substrates to get better surface area, and then eventually scale to larger sizes and improve reproducibility and repeatability. That's it. Are there any questions?